Good evening, lovely listeners, and welcome back to Raven Reads. I'm Raven, and before we get going with tonight's stories, I just wanted to remind you that you can go to ravenreadshorror.com and peruse the enamel pins, art prints, mugs, and apparel that I have there, as well as some other cool things. If you're interested in gaming, digital art, or fine art, I have channels for those as well that are always linked down in the video description. And thank you, as always, to the patrons of this channel for their generous support. If you're interested in behind-the-scenes footage, desktop downloads, and other fun stuff, you can head on over to my Patreon as well. Link is in the description. With that out of the way, you know what time it is. It's time to grab your gear, get a beverage of choice, get comfortable, and get ready to take another journey into the night. This is my father-in-law's experience. This happened to him probably 10 years ago at our hunting camp in Alabama. It popped into my head as we're headed there tomorrow for a few days of deer hunting. He told me to go ahead and share his story. It's short, but as I get a little creeped out in the woods as it is, this would have freaked me out. So as some people probably know, you get out an hour or so before light and climb into a tree stand, a ladder leading up to a seat in a tree, usually fairly deep in the woods to hunt. This foggy morning, my father-in-law has been in his stand for a couple of hours, and it was getting light. He was reading a book as he waited for something to happen. Out of the fog, he hears a woman's voice, much closer than anyone should have been to him at the time. She's calling, Hunter, oh Hunter, in a very sing-songy voice, almost like a mother calling her child in for dinner as he played outside. Now, as I said, he's pretty deep in the woods, and there are sticks and dried leaves everywhere. You generally make a pretty good racket getting to your stand, which is why you go out so early. Not only that, But in order to know where he was and spot him camouflaged in a tree, she must have seen his light when he walked out, followed him into the woods, and waited hours before calling to him. That's the only way she would have gone unnoticed. At first he thought that the woman was calling someone named Hunter, maybe her son. She called again, and that's when he realized that he is the hunter. So he turns around peers into the trees and sees a young woman. She, in very few words and halting speech, explains that something is wrong with her hot water heater and asks if he can come down and look. Now, the strangeness of the situation hadn't quite set in yet, and he's a give-you-the-shirt-off-his-back kind of guy, not to mention 6'2", nearing 300 pounds and carrying a gun, so he wasn't too worried about a small woman. He starts getting down the tree to go have a look. He follows her back to her mobile home, which borders our hunting land, probably a ten minute walk. She walks inside and leaves the door open. He's trailing behind a little, so he gets to the door, kind of knocks, and sticks his head in to say hello. No answer. Where he entered is a laundry room, and he can see that there in the room is a hot water heater and water is just pouring out of a valve at the bottom, just absolutely pouring out onto the floor. He walks over, turns off the valve, sticks his head in the house to say hello again, and nothing. No answer. The house seems completely empty. Empty of people, anyway, but it's a disaster inside. At this point, he's starting to see how strange it all is and decides that this is just the sort of situation that gets you robbed and murdered. He nopes out of there and hurried back to our cabin. Now, we've hunted this land for years, and we've never seen anybody at this place, although until this season, it has shown obvious signs of being lived in. So, every time I pass her place, which backs right up to the road we take to our hunting stands, 
I always wonder about her. I'm not entirely sure if she's actually a real woman, or if maybe it was some ghost or something trying to get him to go there for a particular reason, but it was a creepy experience nonetheless. A few years ago, my friends and I went on a 45-mile, three-night kayaking trip down the Green River in Kentucky. It runs above the Mammoth Cave System, the world's longest known cave system, with more than 400 miles of surveyed passageways. We brought everything we needed in our kayaks and one canoe, food, tents, water filtration, etc. And we camped each night on the riverbank when it started getting dark, and we found level enough ground most times. The first night was uneventful, except to say that there's nothing like a wall of fireflies against a mountainous black tree line at night in the middle of nowhere. The second day, around sunset, after a long day of kayaking and baking in the July heat, we came upon a stream on the bank that opened up into a large ravine. The stream, as we found out, was a cave spring, pouring out blue, freezing cold cave water into a lagoon, about 30 feet wide and so deep the blue water turned black after a few feet. The lagoon had a long, sandy beach, secluded by hills on either side, and a tall, overhanging cliff behind and above us. It was a beautiful, otherworldly place. Time moved very slowly there. We decided to camp there for the night. The sand was soft, white, and very fine, ideal for sleeping. For some reason, the place deeply frightened me, but I didn't speak up. We were all tired and everyone was having fun. We built a small fire and enjoyed the stars through the leaf canopy for a while before everybody went to bed. I slept hard that night. At around 5 a.m., I woke up with an urge to relieve myself. It was still dark. I had the tent door zipper about halfway opened and had just popped my head out when I heard a loud and terrible roar or scream. I immediately cowered back into the tent and zipped it closed, and I waited. The scream came from about ten feet to my left, near the dwindling fire. It was high-pitched, but not like an owl screech, although I'm not ruling that out. It was a wretched, pained scream that got lower-pitched at the end. Being that we were in the middle of nowhere, Kentucky, most likely it was a fox, or a boar, or some kind of bird. Whatever it was, I lay awake for an hour, listening. I heard absolutely nothing. Granted, we were on a soft beach, but I didn't hear a single twig snap, not a single leaf crinkle, when, whatever it was, finally shuffled away. It was bizarre. I should mention at this time that up the beach and off to the side of the lagoon was a small, dry cave opening, maybe three feet wide. I cannot say with any certainty that it was not some ancient cave-dwelling creature that surfaced to investigate our camp. I somehow fell back asleep and awoke the next morning shaken. I asked if any of my friends had heard the terrible scream, but no one had. We pressed on down the Green River. The third night, at dusk, we came upon a large rocky beach. We pulled our boats ashore and decided this would have to do, as we didn't want to go farther down the river and risk being stuck on the water at dark. This rocky beach was where the river split into two, and in the middle formed a collection of pale rocks, tall grass, and dried out wood, a desolate pile of muck the size of a football field. The landmass was covered in jumping sand spiders and tiny frogs. Again, otherworldly. We set up camp, ate, and all went to bed at around the same time. It was silent for probably 20 to 30 minutes, I'm not sure. I was asleep, as the others most likely were as well. I was having a dream, but suddenly... My dream was interrupted by what sounded like a booming, loud, mechanical, wooden beast. I awoke and shot straight up. It was truly the loudest thing I have ever heard. It sounded like a massive bulldozer tearing down a huge steel and wood building. Then came a boom, 
followed by its echo throughout the river valley. The animals shifted and the birds flew away. We were all awoken by the crash and yelling in confusion to each other in our tents. Nothing but silence followed outside our tents, and nobody was particularly willing to shine a flashlight toward the woods. Eventually, we all just decided that it was a falling tree and went back to sleep. The next morning, I thought about it some more. It didn't sound like just a falling tree. I must stress that it had a metallic quality, and it was projected purposefully. It almost sounded like a roar. In the morning light, we found no evidence of anything out of the ordinary, nor any obvious fallen trees that could have made such a loud sound. So we packed up and headed out onto the river, one last time, to head home. My friends and I still talk about that trip and all the weird things that happened. We did the same kayak trip a couple of years later, and nothing out of the ordinary happened. No mysterious forest noises, no crashing, no metallic groaning in the middle of the night, nothing. To both my disappointment and relief. When I was a junior in college, I went camping with four friends in Bald Eagle State Park in Pennsylvania. We had reserved a campsite that was pretty remote, pretty deep in the park, way up on one of the mountains and not near any of the other campsites. It was located at the end of a narrow dirt road, maybe about 75 feet long, which itself broke off from the main road, which was also dirt. There was nothing at the end of the little road except for our campsite. We parked at the entrance and spent the day hiking up to the site, setting up camp, and then hiking around. We made a fire, made dinner, and then turned in. Not long afterward, we discovered that one of the guys with us snored, loudly, like walls of the tent shaking snores. Truly deafening stuff. After probably an hour or so, the rest of us gave up on trying to sleep and climbed out of our tents, leaving our loud friend snoring away in his. My friend at the time was a DJ for our school's radio station, and she had a late night show. I think she was on between midnight and 2 a.m. Since we couldn't sleep, we trekked up to the main road, where the reception was a little better, and where we would actually be able to hear the radio over the snoring. When we got to the road, we stood in a loose circle near the entrance to our site. As we stood there, a black pickup truck, with its lights off, appeared out of the woods and passed us, very slowly. It was unmarked, not a ranger. We listened to the radio for maybe half an hour or 45 minutes after that, and we even briefly called in to say hi. Finally, though, we decided to head back to bed. One of the girls went off into the woods to take care of some things while I climbed back into the tent I shared with her and got into my bag. After a couple of minutes, I heard her moving through the leaves toward the tent, coming from the right. At the same time, I also heard the unmistakable rumble of tires on the ground. I stood up and looked out of the little screen window on the tent. We hadn't bothered to put up the rain fly, as it was a perfectly clear night with a very bright moon, so I could see everything. I saw my friend come sprinting back to the tent and duck behind it, just as the black truck pulls into our campsite, still with its headlights off. Then, it shuts off its engine and sits there. Our friend is still snoring. I have a little knife in my tent, and I know my other two friends have at least one in theirs, but we have no other weapons, no guns, not even bear spray. So we just watch. As I said, it's a clear night, and I can see the truck just fine. It's maybe 20 feet from my tent, but I can't see who's in the truck or how many people there are. Nothing seems to move inside the truck. I still remember the metallic clunk sounds as the engine cooled off. 
I honestly have no idea how long I just watched it. My friend had ducked down behind our tent, and I could hear her breathing. I could hear that she was terrified, but neither of us said a word. It felt like it was a really long time. It had to be at least ten minutes that went by, but it could have been a half an hour or more. We just kept waiting for something to happen. Nothing did. Eventually, the truck starts up again, and then backs up along the narrow, dirt road. It never turned its lights on. I heard it drive back in the direction it had originally come from, and that was it. My friend burst into the tent a second later. Now we're all talking. Did you see that? Holy shit. But our friend is still asleep. Eventually, we just went to bed. We packed up and headed out in the morning just as we had planned. And yes, we checked with the park, and they don't own any black unmarked SUVs, nor did any ranger come to check on our site during the night. To this day, we have no idea who they were or what they wanted. In college, I lived up on top of a mountain road, but still only five miles to town, down a trail through the woods. There was a hundred plus year old oak in the yard, slab stone porch built by hand. I lived in the studio apartment that was outside of the main house. The main house was haunted, but my shack was cozy. The woods up there were weird too. I never really was in the main house at all, but the three who lived there said some nights you couldn't sleep for all the noise. Floorboards creaking, thumps and knocks, that kind of thing. My experiences happened outside. Like I said, I hunted small game up there, as there must have been a rabbit colony in the vicinity, plus a few squirrel drays. Often out there while I was stalking, I'd get the distinct feeling of being stalked myself. Keep in mind, this stand of forest is only several acres, but was preserved mainly because of the historic oak trees scattered around. It's old woods. I would hear laughter, like children's laughter, but not quite like in a creepy movie. It was a bit distorted, and almost like flirty giggles that you imagine a fairy might make. It would come from a different direction each time I sought it. I eventually decided to stop following it and hunt. It never did stop. I would sometimes spend an afternoon in town having drinks or hanging at my friend's place. I'd finally leave and have enough liquid courage to hike back up the trail in the dark. That laughter would be replaced by noise, just like things running all around you and dashing about in the trees. I've been an outdoorsman for a long time, and I know the woods are noisy at night, particularly in the southern Appalachians. But this was different. It was dead silent out there, in that stand at night, except for this rushing to and fro by some unseen feet. Not like game fleeing, though. Deer run away and crash about doing it. I was a big-time night owl back then, and was regularly up doing schoolwork until three or four in the morning. One such night, it had just snowed a fresh twenty inches or so, decent accumulation for the area. Our yard and the woods were like a paradise for me and my dog. I was excited to hunt around the next day for tracks and see if I couldn't locate the rabbit den precisely. I was up working and the dog came scratching to get in, not frantic or anything. I let her in and she lay down to sleep. Odd, because she's a husky and preferred the snow to my tiny heated apartment every time. I decided to call it a night too and went out for a cigarette. It was 3.24 in the morning. I can still see it on top of my MacBook display before I closed it. I went out and noted that the clouds were dispersed a bit and the moon was bright on the snow. I lit my cigarette and was just looking out across the fence and into the woods when something caught my eye. It looked just like a silhouette of somebody leaning against one of those big oak trees, 
Like you'd see somebody with a palm planted against a wall with the arm straight out, leaning against it. It's not moving, so I can't tell if I'm just tired, or the lighting is funny, or what. So, I walked further to the end of the porch, and as soon as I stepped off onto the fresh snow, it took off. The thing was tall. My estimates based on that tree put the thing at seven feet. It ran along the border of the fence, and back off into the woods. It was hairless, as far as I can tell, and completely naked. Otherwise, though, its form was just that of a tall, skinny man. I went inside and switched to boots, grabbed my rifle and my flashlight, and I went to check the tracks. I picked up what had to be a set of size 14 or 15 barefoot tracks. It ran along the fence and down the treeless stretch of backyard, as if heading into the woods. But then, the tracks just ended about 20 feet short of the wood line. I don't know if it jumped to the tree line or what. It probably could have, but there weren't any more tracks that I could find that night or the next day. It was like it just vanished. Never could explain that one. So this happened last year in Virginia and is also the reason I never backpack alone anymore. I was taking summer courses at the time, and we ended up with a three-day weekend in June. So, I thought it was a great time to go explore some of the Virginian wilderness. I did a Google search, found a state park with a trail that looked nice, and let my roommate and family know the trail I was going to be on. When I got close to the park area, I saw a little outdoor shop where people hiking the Appalachian Trail stop. I went in to grab a map of the area, just in case I got lost. As I was talking to the owner, he mentioned a trail that's not well known, that has a pretty cool waterfall and a swimming hole. This piqued my interest, so I had him show me on the map. It took me outside the state park, but he said it was a great place to go. I paid for the map and thanked the owner. I texted my roommate and my parents about the new trail, and I parked my car and set off on my adventure. I should note that the waterfall was going to be a side trip from my journey. I was planning three days and two nights. I started on part of the Appalachian Trail, and it was pretty packed with people, and some of them are really fun to talk to. As expected, I got further and further from the main trails, and I saw fewer and fewer people. Around early afternoon, three miles from my destination, I noticed it was unnaturally silent. No birds. No bugs. Not even wind. And I had the distinct feeling of being watched. I shook it off as me overanalyzing the situation. I got to the waterfall, and it wasn't too spectacular, but it was cool to look at. Plus, it had a good-sized area to swim in. So, naturally, I stripped down to my skivvies and took a dip. It was pretty refreshing. As I was getting my clothes back on, I started whistling to myself. That's when I heard something whistle the same tune back. I thought it was a bird copying me, so I went back and forth with it, and it would repeat whatever I whistled. I thought it was pretty neat. As I was setting up camp, I couldn't shake this feeling that I was being watched again. Like, I would get goosebumps, and my hair would stand up on end. As night fell, I built a small fire and lit my jet boil to make some dinner. As I did this, I became hyper aware that again, there was no sound. Just deafening silence. Some part of my brain was telling me that I wasn't safe and that I should leave. I ignored it and crawled into my tent with my flashlight and book. I went to sleep without incident. When I woke up the next morning, my sight was trashed. My camp stool was nowhere to be found. My bear bag with my food was cut down and the contents were thrown across the site. My first thought was that a crafty animal had chewed through the rope and got the bag. But I looked at the rope and it was cut with something very sharp. 
Plus, none of the food was even touched. I also noticed bare footprints, human footprints, all around my campsite. Keep in mind, I'm at least six to eight miles from any road. As I was looking at the mess, I heard a branch snap off in the distance. I turned to look in that direction. I saw nothing. But I heard that whistling again. My whistle from yesterday. But it was different. It sounded more sinister. It made my hair stand on end. And this is when I listened to my instincts to get the hell out of there. It sounded like it was a little off in the distance, so I packed up my camp as fast as I could. As I did, the whistling got closer and closer as I finally finished stuffing the tent into my bag. I didn't even bother with putting anything away properly. I just wanted to get out. The whistling was incessant and sounded like it was coming from all directions. I got fed up with it and finally I stood and yelled into the woods, Shut up! What the hell do you want? It stopped whistling, and it was quiet for a moment. And then it repeated everything I had just said, in my voice. It sounded just like me, but distorted, like it was coming from an old television. After I heard this, I immediately threw my pack on and ran in the direction I'd come from. I heard it moving, just behind me, fast switching between the whistle and my voice. It felt like it was toying with me, not coming too close, but never being too far. Eventually, it sounded like it got farther and farther away from me, and then it suddenly stopped. When it stopped, I stopped and turned around. I wish I never had, because I heard the most bone-chilling screech I've ever heard coming from right next to me. That's when I started running again. I didn't look, I just ran. Less than a half mile, I ran into a couple that was also backpacking. They saw the look of terror on my face and asked if it was me that had screamed and asked if I was okay. I told them about what happened and they decided not to go down from where I had just come from. We moved to a more populated trail and as quickly as we could, all got the hell out of there. As soon as I got back in my car, I drove to one of the park's ranger stations and reported what had happened. Since the site was off park grounds, they told me it wasn't in their jurisdiction, but that they would send a ranger to investigate. The ranger station's parking lot runs right up to the woods. As I was getting into my jeep, I hear the whistling coming from the woods just in front of me. The neighborhood where I grew up was more or less suburbs, except the back end of it borders a massive field where nothing has been planted for decades. Part of that border is buffered by woods, and it's in those woods where my friends and I would always play. One sunny day, we were particularly deep in the little section of forest. We were attempting to pick through what looked like very overgrown dozer tracks. The woods are thick across North Carolina, but the central and eastern portion is thick with kudzu in particular, and it was giving us hell. We had probably made a mile of progress into this track when we came across a depression full of water. I hesitate to even say that it was a pond because it was perfectly round like a crater. The water had obviously receded and in the middle of it was the exposed roof of an old car. At about that time, one friend found a license plate under the pine duff. It was tagged with buckshot. Next, a door. A full car door, half buried under pine duff, riddled with bullet holes and shot. Certainly not an uncommon way to have fun in the south, go out, have a few beers with your buddies and see some old junk. But what we found next wasn't a run-of-the-mill Saturday night. 
bones. Our still innocent minds first assumed it was a white-tailed deer. We started dragging out bones and laying them out side by side. I'm not sure if our objective was to make a museum quality deer skeleton or what, but that's what we did. Then the pelvis came up. I recognized it immediately because my uncle was a chiropractor and had a full model skeleton in his office named Mr. Bones that I would always look at. The more I started to look at our growing collection, the more I started to see Mr. Bones taking shape. I got this weird gut feeling, and being the oldest, I told everybody to stop digging and that we needed to go. There was some protest, but I convinced everyone that this was the best thing to do. We hiked back the way we'd been coming in and went back to the pool down the road, finished out the day, and went home. But I couldn't stop thinking about those bones. That night, I told my mom about what we had found. Then I had to tell Dad the story. At first, they weren't convinced, but I wasn't a dumb kid. I knew what I had seen out there. They talked behind closed doors, going back and forth. The next day, I told the story to two sheriff's deputies and took them to the area where we had entered the woods. About an hour later, there were police vehicles packing the tiny dead end leading off to the woods. Chainsaws cleared brush and men in white shirts with detective badges smoked cigarettes and talked amongst each other as men carried bags from the forest and put them into vehicles. Then they were gone. I waited months to hear something, anything, nothing. I asked my parents what had happened, did they figure it out, and over time their answers would get more and more uninteresting. Eventually I quit asking and forgot about it for the most part. It faded into a memory, fuzzy and dreamlike, the way childhood memories are. Eventually, I came home from college and I was sitting out by the fire with an old neighborhood friend who had been there that day. He saw everything I saw. We started talking about it after a few beers and got curious about the outcome. We started researching online and couldn't find a single word of information on a skeleton discovered in our neighborhood. It was baffling. I asked my parents the next day and they said they had no idea what I was talking about. His parents said the same thing. Whatever happened that day, whatever they found, it was intentionally buried and forgotten. To this day, they all hold adamant that it never happened, but we hold adamant that it did. A little bit of background about myself. I've worked my entire adult life in the Pacific Northwest woods, over 15 years in total, with about seven years of that being for the Park Service at Olympic National Park. Many, many experiences over the years could warrant the title of creepy. This one in particular has always stuck with me. While working for the Park Service, one of my jobs was that of a restoration carpenter. We would travel to old backcountry historical cabins, emergency shelters, homesteads, and things like that, tasked with repairing and restoring them to their original historically accurate states. This was a wonderful and demanding job. I'd spend eight days at a time living off the beaten path, usually deep in the backcountry. Sometimes we'd be flown in supplies. Sometimes we would use llamas or mules to pack our gear. All the while, we would sleep in thinly walled single tents, cooking over a fire or whisper light stove, using the same tools and techniques the original homesteaders had at their disposal in the late 1800s to construct and survive in this unforgiving environment. One late fall, I was assigned to work near Lake Ozette at an old homestead off the trail near the constructed boardwalk. For those unfamiliar with the area, Lake Ozette is eight miles long and three miles wide. It sits as the largest unaltered natural lake in Washington state. Lake Ozette has a long and rich history of Native American culture. 
The Macabre Tribal Center in Nia Bay houses discoveries found in the area dating back 2,000 years, along with a local village that was well preserved over 300 years ago by a mudslide that left most of the artifacts intact. The Ozette Loop Trail, which the homestead was directly adjacent to, is approximately 9.4 miles through and through. The man-made boardwalk takes you under giant cedar groves, meanders through huge patches of chest-high salal, before delivering you to Alstrom's Prairie, about two and a half miles from the trailhead. Alstrom's Prairie, a giant, soggy meadow, was once farmed by two Swedish immigrants. They constructed a small cabin and some outbuildings on the 150-acre bog. With cattle, sheep, vegetable gardens, and the help of a little Swedish ingenuity, they managed to etch out lives for themselves here for over 50 years. Over time, the forest, as it always does, decided to take back what was once its own. The now decades-long abandoned farm was hardly recognizable. Our job was to beat back the encroaching forest, put new windows in the main cabin, pipe in a new stove, apply fresh paint, and fix up portions of the semi-dilapidated barn. The ultimate goal was to allow guided tours to take place at some time in the future. For about three weeks, we stayed at the Ozette bunkhouse while working at Alstrom's. This was good duty for us. We weren't sleeping under the rain, our beds were warm, our hike was short, and the terrain wasn't difficult. We even had a TV. The bunkhouse was located near the highway and ranger station. We would hike the five-mile loop every day, bringing with us boards, tools, paint, and everything else we would need on our backs. These were full, ten-plus-hour days. Usually, we started our morning hike at around 7 a.m., and we began our evening return hike back to the bunkhouse at around 5. At one point during the fall, there were four of us working this project, but at the time of this event, there were only two of us remaining. Most of the hard work had already been finished. We needed to hike a few last boards into the prairie to complete a portion of the woodshed before we could call the job done. I volunteered to be the pack mule for the day my only job being to carry as many boards as I could muster in each trip to the prairie before returning to the ranger station for the next load. It was late in the season for hikers at this point. The weather had turned, and we'd be lucky to see two to three people in an entire day doing the loop. After around my fourth or fifth trip, I was pretty wiped. It was getting late in the evening now, around 4 p.m., and my co-worker had called it a day. I thought I could get one more trip in before it got too dark. My rationale being that the more trips I did today, the less I would have to do tomorrow. We passed on the trail, I told him my intentions, and I continued on. I delivered the last boards for the day, took a look around the prairie as the sun started to tuck behind the trees, and started my hour-long hike back to the ranger station. The lighting on the boardwalk was quite low at this point, the cedars blocking most of the ambient light left by the setting sun and making visibility quite diminished. I'm not a nervous hiker, and I fail to spook easily. Having solo hiked for weeks on end in the backcountry, I've been stalked by cougars, confronted by Kodiak bears in Alaska, and even ran into a few demented hillbillies over the years. As I left the prairie that evening, though, the hair on the back of my neck stood on end. Goosebumps erupted from my forearms. An uneasy feeling swept over me, and suddenly I found myself wanting to walk faster, to jog, and then to sprint. I didn't. Instead, I convinced myself that I had been reading far too many novels before bedtime. I walked another five minutes or so before I started to hear something faint, something that sounded like music. Impossible, I told myself. I'm the only one out here, and still at least two miles from civilization. That civilization, in reality, being likely the only other soul out there, my co-worker. Sure enough, however, I heard music. 
more specifically, a piano. It started out so faint, I had to stop moving and actually try to hear it. The steps on the wooden boardwalk were too loud and covered it up. Every time I paused to hear it, it became unmistakable. It got louder. I stood there, sun now fully hidden behind the horizon in total silence other than this piano. I became aware that there were no longer the noises of life. No birds, no insects, no wind, no rustling of leaves or underbrush, absolutely nothing other than the piano. It was as if everything was being weighted down by a fog of emptiness of some kind. I've encountered this dead time before in the woods. Certain places have it. But this was different somehow, unique to this location, unique to this moment in time. I tried to focus on the keys, but I couldn't quite recognize the composition. Unsurprising, since I mostly listened to Metallica and Korn at the time. It was playing with a purpose. It was controlled, in tune, thoughtful. It was a song, and somehow I felt that it was meant just for me in this moment. I started walking again. Almost on cue, the music got louder. As my pace increased, so did the tempo of the keys, still in tune, never faltering. It reached a climax, the perfect combination of my haste, my dread, my heartbeat, and the tempo of the music. And then, as quickly as it came, the piano stopped, whooshed away in the fraction of a moment. It didn't trail off, it didn't fade into extinction, it was just gone. Suddenly, everything that was absent was swept away as if by a gust of wind. The stillness was gone. The gloom, the stagnation, and weight of everything was just lifted. My next step on the boardwalk was once again in reality. The evening was just as absent of light as before, but it felt like life, somehow, was once again injected back into the forest. The woods seemed normal again. I didn't hear the piano again that night, nor did I sense anything unusual. I told my co-worker every detail when I reached the bunkhouse, and he showed no sign of disbelief. We didn't talk about it again until years later, when something similar happened to another Park Service employee. I told my grandfather about what happened. He was a retired park ranger who had worked at nearby Mora just the next station over. Without the least bit of hesitation, he goes, Did you hear the bagpipes along with it, or just the piano this time? This story is from when I lived off the grid in the forest of western North Carolina. Some friends and I all lived in these small shacks, essentially a shed with a loft. They were very close together, so we all lived together in a community. Living in such primal and close conditions breeds a kind of deep, trusting friendship that you just can't get from living anywhere else. Naturally, we did almost everything together. By our little semicircle of houses, there was a railroad track. If you followed it south, it would lead to a waterfall. This waterfall, in particular, is where everybody would go to get high. It was a normal night, humid, sometime in early July. A group of about six friends and I, Laura, Andy, Nick, and some of Andy's friends that I didn't know that well but recognized, decided to walk out to this waterfall in the dark. I was the only sober one in the group, so I felt a higher sense of responsibility for everyone and was therefore on edge and hyper aware of our surroundings. Others would walk faster or slower, or stop altogether in the group. So it was natural, and expected, that we wouldn't be able to see everyone at the same time. Andy was in rare form, though. When Laura had to stop to pee, he came out of the bushes and scared her, and then ran off ahead behind the rest of the group. 
This pissed off both me and Laura, since it was such a clear invasion of privacy and unnecessarily spooky in the already creepy night. Laura and I eventually got to where we could see Andy again, but he was walking by himself, and then he slipped back into the bushes without even looking at us. Dismissing it as him just being affected, we kept moving forward. Still not back with the whole group yet, we realized that Andy had followed in behind us, just far enough away that we could only see his silhouette. Finally, we catch up with the rest of the group and see that all of us are accounted for, even Andy. We asked him how he got ahead of us and beat us to the group, when he had last been seen at least 15 yards behind us just minutes ago. Everyone went dead silent, as Laura and I realized that whoever had scared her when she peed, and whoever had followed us after that, wasn't Andy or anyone else from the group. We never made it to the waterfall. When I was working as a backpacking guide in western North Carolina, my schedule dictated a full eight-day shift with six days off. During those six days, myself and other co-workers would play in the woods. In the summer, you can't beat a mountain swimming hole. One of our favorites was called Paradise Falls, alternately called Wolf Creek Falls. This is a cliff jumping spot with a huge swimming area, a tiny slot canyon, and an inner pool. Most will venture to do the small jump into the inner pool. Even though it's the smallest jump, it's arguably the least accessible. Even though the jump is nine feet at most, you have to work through a 10-minute rock scramble to get to the top of it. We were all venturing in, and from inside the tiny canyon, you can't see the main pool. Well, we got to the jump and coaxed the first person off, a fellow guide who had never been to the spot before. She jumped successfully and swam out into the main pool and beach area beyond our eyesight, and then screamed. Because she was now out of sight, myself and another guy jumped in together and swam the short distance to her, with others in tow. Of course, we figured she was injured somehow. She was treading water and just staring, wide-eyed at the riverbank. When I looked to the shore, I saw what she had screamed at. There stood a man. He was massively large, easily 6'6 and a little change. He wore beat-up overalls and no shirt. There didn't appear to be a hair on him. Perhaps the most disturbing was that he had folds of skin all over his body. Imagine the Michelin Man, but made of flesh. His face, his arms, his chest, everything had a uniform layer of shingled fat rolls. And he was brandishing a shotgun. The area around Wolf Creek is just holler after holler, but there are a few residences, and those few have been there for generations, propagated by the same families. These people don't like outsiders, and so they keep relations within the family. I could only surmise that this individual was the product of inbreeding over decades. He just stood there and watched as we scrambled to grab anything important and stuff it in a bag. He stood and watched as we hightailed it out of that basin and back toward the parking area and never said a word. I was backpacking through Pisgah National Forest in North Carolina with my dog. Just the two of us, and we were exploring the woods around Little Lost Cove. We were going open orienteering style, so we were not on an established trail. We'd been hiking throughout the day, following a creek, and toward the evening, I noticed my dog was acting abnormally. She was very much caught in a scent of something, and wouldn't ease up. This continued for about two hours before we made camp. That night in camp, she remained on edge and stared off into the woodline. I went about my camp business as usual, and then, at around midnight, I got this prickly feeling, like I was being watched intently. 
I felt the feeling ride for a little bit and I kept tinkering with the fire. And then I heard the brush rustle. I got up from the fire and shone my flashlight up the hillside. A figure on all fours just managed to escape the beam, all but the tail. It was a tail that I knew was not supposed to exist in the southern Appalachians. I cast my light again across the hillside, and this time I caught its eyes. Two glowing yellow orbs, just watching and waiting. At that point, I went into a fury, grabbed my tomahawk, and charged up the hill after the beast, screaming and cursing all the while. The watcher ran off, but neither I or the dog slept that night. The following morning, we left camp at first light and began hiking up the mountain to the ridgeline, which would lead us out. Atop the ridgeline in the fresh mud were a series of tracks tracks left by an animal that officially no longer exists in the eastern U.S. They were catamount tracks. They commonly go by cougars in the east, but we'd been stalked by a mountain lion just the same. Those tracks ran across the ridge, revealing that it had been watching and stalking us throughout the entire previous day as we hiked through the creek bed below. They weren't bobcat tracks, I know those. They were way too big, and so were the eyes I saw. I truly believe that if my dog hadn't given me some red flags, I would have been mauled that night. It remains one of my personal scariest experiences ever, and it just goes to show that sometimes, when you feel that something's creepy and off, it can be a lot scarier than a ghost. I work for a well-known university as a field biologist and have recently been contracted out to the National Forest Service. My first assignment has been in the Potomac District of the Monongahela National Forest. Basically, I receive GPS coordinates and I either drive or hike to the designated spot and do whatever they want me to do. This could be setting up trail cameras or counters, monitoring equipment, doing trail surveys and the like, and then recording the data 24 hours after placement. No big deal. I thought it odd that they specifically requested I place the cameras only three feet off the ground and some of the infrared cameras in the trees at specified heights. Some of these locations are on designated trails, but some are way off the trail in places that humans would never go. Sometimes there isn't a hotel or lodging close enough. These are the remote mountains in West Virginia. And the Forest Service has outfitted me in some pretty dank camping gear on the occasions I might have to camp. I am an experienced hiker and camper and have spent many nights alone out in the field due to my career choice. I'm a woman, about five foot six and 130 pounds, but I'm not really afraid of anything. Again, the Forest Service has outfitted me well, and I wear an emergency beacon that will send every law enforcement officer in the area to my location in no time. So, I've been assigned to this district for a few months now and have really enjoyed my work. West Virginia is very remote and unspoiled, and that's why I do what I do. I get to see things most people wouldn't, and I've had so many positive and almost spiritual moments up until a few nights ago. I was working up near Spruce Knob, which is the highest point in West Virginia, and a complex system of trails, wilderness areas, camping, and so on. It's also been snowing, with howling winds and ice storms. I was camping up there to complete my work, and while the conditions were rough, I was almost enjoying it. My first night in the woods was pretty peaceful. I made dinner, set up camp, and drank some whiskey. I snuggled down in my sleeping bag and slept like a rock. It was very cold, but I wear this turtle fur face mask thing and didn't feel the cold too much. I woke up at dawn and went about building my fire back up and starting some coffee when I noticed all this churned up snow around my campsite. Not tracks, just churned up snow like someone or something had kicked it all around. Weird, but whatever. 
I had a 15 mile hike to set some cameras and didn't really have time to wonder about it. I set off on my hike, did what I had to do and started back to camp. I never wear earbuds or anything because hearing is one of the most important senses in the wilderness. I want to be able to hear any animals or people before I see them. It was already past dark when I made it back to camp and I was too tired to do anything except strip down to my base layer, get into my sleeping bag, and pass out. At around 2 a.m. I woke up because I could hear people talking. People. I was 30 miles up a gravel road that was locked with forest service gates and around 10 miles from where my truck was parked and I could hear voices. I completely lost my shit. I have a firearm and I quietly retrieved it from my pack and got back into my sleeping bag, cocked it, and waited. I was on high alert, all my senses going wild. Eventually the voices faded and I couldn't hear them anymore, but I never went back to sleep. At daylight I emerged from my tent to more churned up snow, and my two trail cameras hanging from a tree, about five feet from my tent. Cams I had placed 15 miles out from my campsite. I packed my shit as fast as I could and hauled ass back to my truck. Along the way, I saw a lot of human boot tracks all around my site. When I reached my truck, I discovered it had been broken into, and my computer and some other equipment had been stolen. I'm currently sitting in a luxury log cabin at some resort, too scared to retrieve my other equipment, and too embarrassed to tell my supervisors how scared I am. The Forest Service bought me a new truck while my other one is getting the window replaced, and I did make a report about the theft, but there is no way in hell I am ever going back to that site. I don't know if this means I'll be fired or sent to work at a desk, but... Out of all the years I've been doing this in the national forests all over the country, this is the most terrified I have ever been. I'm not scared of animals, and I have many stories to share about my encounters with them, but I am scared of people. It's not unusual for me to trek out on solo hiking day trips. For context, I'm a 31-year-old female. I frequently visit the nearby provincial parks in Canada that are generally well used. It's rare that I end up on a hike not at least seeing one or two people. I grew up going on camping and hiking trips, and I feel very comfortable out in nature. I always inform people where I'm going and when I'm expected to be back. Safety first, right? One day last year, I was going stir-crazy. So I took myself out to a popular nature educational center. A bunch of trails stem from this one spot. They're not long trails, but they are all interconnected, so it's easy to create your own distance. It was midweek, so I wasn't expecting to encounter many people, maybe a school group at most. I grab my backpack, lock the car, and head out. It was a beautifully sunny day mid-autumn, so it was a little chilly out. I was listening to the sounds of nature surrounding me. Some squirrels, birds, even a deer crossed my trail at one point. I was sticking with the main trail, which had educational signs identifying the different types of plants as he went along. I have been trying to teach myself how to identify different trees on site, so this path was the best. I made my way up the first little hill, and then I made my way down the path, where it takes a sharp right turn. Up ahead, I caught sight of a man wearing a dark blue jacket. Strange, I hadn't seen any signs of the person or heard them, but whatever. Normally, I'm comforted seeing somebody else on the trail, but this time my gut instinct was not happy. I made a note of which way the person went and continued along. Blue Jacket had taken the path that I wanted to take to create a longer hike. It would have been a lot more secluded and less traveled. So for once I tried to be smart 
listen to my gut and just follow the main route back to my car. Keep it short and safe. There would be other days for a long hike. I still had about two kilometers to get back to the parking lot. Clouds decided that they wanted to skirt across the sky, making the woods a little dull and ominous. I kept looking over my shoulder, feeling very unsettled. The trees cast finger-like shadows that did not help calm my imagination at all. One of my favorite spots on this main trail had a few huge boulders or rock formations right smack dab in the middle that you had to go around. Really neat for photos and climbing on a normal day. But today, they filled me with even more dread. I couldn't pinpoint why, at first until I noticed some scuffs around the base of the rocks, going the wrong way around. The trail is very obvious which way to go, left, and these marks were to the right. It was like somebody walked around the rocks dragging their foot behind them. An animal? Maybe. I couldn't figure it out. I wanted to turn around and go back the way that I'd come, but that would have added another four kilometers to get back to the car. I stuck close to the far side of the real path, keeping a close eye on the rock formation. As I made it to the other side of the rocks, I caught sight of some blue fabric, the same blue jacket that I saw earlier. The person moved, as if ducking down between some rocks to avoid being seen. For Blue Jacket Man to reach the rocks before me, he either cut his own path through the woods or sprinted through about five to six kilometers of trails. I didn't like the thought of either option, as I didn't know this person, and at this point, I didn't want to know them. Maybe he was taking a leak. Yeah, I'll go with that. I picked up my pace and dug my phone out. I texted my usual hiking friend, telling her all the details in case I went missing. Yes, I attempted to do this while following the path. I only walked into one tree. I glanced behind me again while the rocks were still in sight and I saw the man just standing there, looking at me. I ran the rest of the way back to my car, hopped in, and immediately locked the doors. Curiously, there wasn't a single other vehicle in the parking area or on the road nearby. This place was nowhere near any towns, so I have no clue where Blue Jacket came from. I took a couple of minutes to sort myself out in the car, and as I pulled out to leave, I looked at the trailhead. There was that damn blue jacket on the signpost I had just passed to get to my car with nobody visible nearby. I was so spooked by this encounter that I refused to ever hike there alone again. Maybe it was all just an innocent misunderstanding, but it sure scared the hell out of me. This is a true story that happened to me, my girlfriend Amy, and my stepsister Rose. This happened when I was 13 on a summer night in July. It was dark, and I lived in a trailer park at the time in Ohio. I lived in a small town. Not very small, but you get the idea. You can't find it on a lot of maps. The layout is kind of odd, with two entrances, one by the center and one in the back. The trailer park is basically three connected loops and one going uphill with its own road. The first loop has two roads on what we call the hill. The farthest road up is by a small patch of woods and is the darkest part of the trailer park at night. Sometimes one of the streetlights wouldn't come on. It was by the farthest turn from the entrance and really dark at night. I lived by the center entrance in trailer four. At the time, my girlfriend and I weren't dating, but we still hung out a lot. She lived a row down from me, but it was easy just to cut through the yards to get to her house. That night, Amy and I were arguing about something pretty stupid, as teens do. Rose is a couple of years younger than Amy and I, but liked to be with us anyway. We were on the hill, just turning onto the darkest street, when Rose decided she didn't want to deal with Amy and I arguing anymore. She sped ahead of us, and I watched her ride off. I wasn't worried, since she was surprisingly smart and strong for her age. She's also pretty tall, 
Unfortunately, her character doesn't quite fit her build as she's pretty shy. Anyway, she went ahead of us and got to the darkest point of that street, the corner, and froze. She looked up into the woods. No, stared into the woods. Terrified. I attempted to catch up to her, but before I could get to her, she turned and took off on her scooter. I stopped and waited for Amy to catch up. Of course, she yelled at me for running like that. She thought I was trying to ditch her. I apologized and told her that I wanted to ask Rose why she'd gone so far ahead of us. I knew if I told her about Rose stopping and looking in the woods, she would want to investigate. Though I brushed it off as her getting scared of a shadow, I couldn't help but feel like something was watching us as we passed that area. A little while later, Amy decided to walk off to cool down. I didn't stop her. In fact, I didn't blame her. I can get pretty annoying at times. What concerned me, though, was that we still hadn't seen Rose. After Amy walked off, I circled the trailer park a couple of times before I finally saw her. She was on the complete opposite side of the trailer park from where she took off. I ran up to her, yelling out her name. As I got closer, I realized that she was close to crying. She began rambling about something in the woods, about how she thought whatever it was got me and Amy. I calmed her down to explain to me what she saw. Now, here's a disclaimer. Bear with me here. I know people are going to be like, oh, this is vague because of what I explain. And no, I'm not making this a Slenderman story. This is what she saw, and it will not be the only spirit or person we see. Again, this is not some kind of Slender Man ripoff. In fact, whatever this thing is, I still see this guy from time to time. Anyway, back to the story. She told me that whatever she saw had no face, just a place where sockets and a nose would be. They were tall, with pale skin, and an all-black suit except the undershirt, which almost matched their skin. I was sure she was seeing things, but to make her feel better, I decided that we should go back up to the woods and look. She agreed, and we made our way out to the woods. Once we got back to the road, we walked silently, listening for anything that might be in the woods. We heard nothing. But the entire time, we felt as though we were being watched. Once we made it to the corner... We still hadn't seen or heard anything. I had her go ahead of me, just in case. As I started to calm down, thinking it was nothing, I felt like somebody may have been following us. When I turned around, I swear that I saw what she did, standing in the tree line, just staring in our direction. I felt myself begin to panic, but remained calm on the outside. I told Rose just to keep moving. As we walked, I realized that whatever was there was inching closer to us, coming out of the woods. They were about seven feet tall. They didn't seem to be moving any of their body parts. They were just floating. When we turned the next corner, I told her to go as fast as she could, and I ran to keep up with her. Once we made it off the hill, we went back to our house and went inside. But once I went in, I realized Amy was still out there on her own. I told Rose I was going to go find her. I tried to make her stay, but she insisted on coming with me. So I let her. We found her around where I had found Rose. I previously forgot to tell Rose not to tell Amy about the figure in the woods, but before I could say anything, Rose blurted the whole story out. Amy thought somebody was just messing with us and decided that she was going to go into the woods and confront them on her own. Exactly what I was afraid of. I tried to talk her out of it the entire time we walked there. Of course, my words didn't faze her, and she went up into the woods anyway. I yelled that I was going to walk Rose home, and that I'd be back. As we walked down the hill, about halfway, I heard a distant, inhuman shriek come out of the woods. I told Rose to run home as fast as she could, and I turned back, running to see if Amy was okay. I didn't get very far before I saw her running. Mind you, this was the first time I had ever seen her scared after three years of knowing her, so I knew something was wrong. I stopped, and she just kept saying, Run! Run home! So we all fled back to my house. Once we got there, we were all tired, panting, and sweaty. You should have seen how confused my mother was. 
She asked us what was wrong, but I knew she wouldn't believe us. And even if she did, I didn't want her involved with this. So I just told her that we had decided to run back, as some kind of competition. We all went to my room and closed the curtains. We also turned the closet light on and closed the door. We all sat down, and I asked Amy what she saw when she was up there. She told me that she saw a tall black shadow. No legs, but they did have arms. And they were about eight feet tall, and they were carrying something large and dripping. Their back was turned to her, so she shouted to them. She started swearing and yelling. Once they turned around, though, they looked directly at her, revealing a white porcelain mask with red lips and markings above the eyes. It stretched out an empty arm, pointing at her before letting out a loud shriek, and that's when she ran out of the woods and told us to go. The rest of the night, the two beings harassed all three of us. There are three particular moments I remember vividly. The first was when I looked into the yard through my curtains. They both stood there, staring into the window. The second, we all went outside to look for my cat. I looked under a car for him, but fell back when I saw the one without a face laying there, just staring back at me, his head tilted in a curiously twisted manner. Don't worry, we did eventually find the cat and bring him inside. The third one I didn't actually see, but Amy told me about it. She said when we came back to my room after looking, she saw a pair of feet behind my closet door. When she looked away and looked back, they were gone. After that, we turned the light off and ignored the closet. I managed to convince my mom to let her stay the night that night, but we didn't sleep much. Rose ended up falling asleep around 2 in the morning, and Amy and I fell asleep on the couch together at about 4.30. The next day, Rose and Amy and I decided to go up to the woods and investigate the area where Amy saw the masked one. As we suspected, when we got there, there was blood on the tree that the entity had stood by, and a trail of blood on the path leading to some bushes. For the sake of not wanting to find anything we couldn't unsee, we decided not to look in the bushes and walked out of the woods. Ever since then, these entities have been following us and communicating with us. They taught us about their meetings and stuff like that. I have attended a few, but hardly remember what I did or said. But Crescent, the masked one, and Faceless, pretty self-explanatory, are not the only ones. There's also Leo, who looks like Crescent, but is slightly taller, only has one eye hole in his mask, and is missing an arm, who's second in command. There's Angel, who always walks with a noose hanging around her throat. The Weeper, who's covered in bruises and cuts and slits all over. He leaves blood and tears wherever he goes. The Puppeteer is the leader. He can control whoever he wants, but gives great pain to himself and whoever is around while he takes over someone. And then there's the Executioner. If you see him, that usually means something bad is going to happen to you or someone close to you soon. He's a tall, cloaked figure, no lie, about 20 feet tall. You can't see his face, but when you see him, it's kind of creepy. Before I moved away, I was walking the trailer park pretty late, and I looked up. Across the main road that the trailer park sat behind in a storage unit lot, I saw him standing there. I got so angry I ran at him. Once I reached the middle of the road, he vanished completely. And then, I noticed a car coming down the road, speeding. Luckily, I got out of the way. A month after seeing him, my father died of cardiac arrest. The blood vessels in his heart constricted so tightly that blood couldn't flow through it, and it failed. The worst thing is, no matter what, they always find you. Not too long ago, I moved away from the trailer park, but they found me. I still see Leo and Crescent around, walking in the woods or watching me. It's terrifying. I don't know what they want, but they always find me. At school, at home, at the mall. Hell, they followed me to North Carolina on a vacation once. I had to stay away from my family there so they wouldn't take interest in them. I currently think that Leo is attempting to get revenge on me for calling him a one-armed bastard at a meeting. You should have seen how pissed Amy was the next time I saw her. She was like, you're such an idiot, they're gonna kill you. 
I brushed it off, but I don't know. I guess he's still pissed about it. Anyway, I hope you at least enjoyed this story, but if you have any suggestions on what I should do, or you know what they are, let me know. I was with my niece, who's on her high school soccer team, and is taking it pretty seriously, and attempting to get some kind of scholarship out of it. I'm pretty healthy, and I don't really work out too much, but something I often do is run and hike. I live in Kentucky, not in a rural part, but there's a state park near my house that's 6,500 acres, so it's pretty secluded and densely wooded. There are some really nice trails that allow you to run for a good chunk and then hike for a bit to split up the long bits of the trail that are flat. She decided to tag along with me today for a quick three to four mile run. It was raining, but nothing too heavy. Kind of a spitting rain. Nothing we can't handle. We got up to the peak of this one hill, and it had been about two miles or so, according to our phones. So we decided to turn back and head back to the car. As we were headed down the steep side of the climb, we were walking pretty slowly, just to make sure we didn't slip and lose our footing. When out of nowhere, there was the coldest chill that came from behind us once we made it about halfway down. At the time it happened, we both commented on how cold it was, but we didn't make too much out of it, and just went on with our conversation. In these woods, there are some wildlife, like small deer and maybe some coyotes, but they tend to stay away from the paths. At least I have only heard them in my many years of coming here. Never once have I seen anything more than a few tracks. Once we got off the hillside and hit a stretch of the trail that was flatter ground, we began to pick up the pace when a deer darted across the path, maybe ten yards in front of us, causing us to stop in our tracks. The first deer was then followed by three more, and not one of them even so much as looked in our direction. My niece looked at me, puzzled because of the oddity of it. To me, they acted like they were running from something, a predator of some kind. Once they'd gone, we started back with our run, and we heard a noise behind us, a loud, booming noise of something of substance falling to the ground from some height. When we stopped and turned, we saw nothing. No animals scurrying away like one would expect after a substantial noise in the wilderness. In fact, everything was eerily calm. Just as we looked at each other to ask what the actual hell that was, there was yet another cold wind gush through the valley, pushing all the rain off the leaves surrounding us, soaking our sweatshirts. Internally, I started to freak out, but I was doing my best to stay calm for my 17-year-old niece but I'm pretty sure she could tell that I was freaked out. I tell her, come on, let's get to the car. And we turn to take off again. And there was a man, leaned up against a tree on the side of the trail dressed in a black suit with a white button-up shirt. His collar was open, but he had a tie on, sagging like a tired businessman on the way home from a long day. It startled me at first. I wasn't expecting to see anybody out there for a few reasons. One is that we were at the very least a mile away from any parking lot or street, another being that we never heard or saw him coming, and the stretch of trail we were on was flat and open for a good half a mile. I got over to put myself between the man and my niece as we jogged past him. When we did, I looked him in the eye and gave him a how you doin' nod as we went along. He was sort of pale, his eyes were very white but his irises were ice blue. Everything that I saw from the quick look I got up close looked to be clean cut and proper. I didn't notice a speck of mud anywhere on him, and the two of us had it caked on the bottom of our shoes and even on the backs of our pants and shirts from kicking it up as we ran. We had to get to the top of another hill, smaller than the last, but still quite the hike up. Once on top, I took a quick look behind us, and he had seemed to vanish without a trace. Now with having the vantage point of the hill, I could see out past the trail and see most of the hill that she and I had just come from, and yet he was nowhere in sight. I scanned off the sides of the trail and still nothing. My niece asked me who that guy was and why he was out so deep in the woods wearing a suit. 
questions I simply didn't have the answers to. We made it back to the car with nothing else out of the ordinary happening to us on the trail. As we came to my car, I pulled the keys from my pocket and unlocked the doors for maybe ten feet out. Walking up to the only car in the entire lot, I noticed muddy footprints coming away from my car door from the driver's side. Weird, considering I had no mud on my shoes when we got there. But there are trails leading up to the lot, so I figured maybe somebody came through before we got there and I just never noticed. However, when I pulled the handle to open the door, the handle was caked with mud underneath, almost like somebody was attempting to open my door with a muddy hand. Nothing more happened, but the entire encounter leaves chills covering my body the more I think about it. I live in the suburbs of Dublin, Ireland, where I'm surrounded by greenery, beautiful hiking trails, and lots of Celtic mysticism. One particular hiking trail is called the Hellfire Club. There's a lot of stories that have been passed on from generation to generation as to where it got the name. But the most popular, as far as I'm aware, is that on top of the mountain where the trail passes is an old, completely deteriorated stone house. Legend has it that back in the day, it was a hangout spot where men would drink, play cards, and have a merry old time. One night, a group of men were playing cards, and a stranger asked if he could join in. During the game, one of the men dropped a card, bent down to pick it up off the ground, and realized the stranger that had joined them had hoofed feet. So, present day, this trail is very popular for hikers and campers. This particular day, three friends decided to go camping and set up tent beside an old hunting lodge. After a few hours, they noticed that someone had set up camp quite close by. Not weird, but maybe a little odd. This guy decided to approach the three campers and introduce himself, and ended up chatting with them for a few hours. After some time had passed, one of the campers decided that they needed more firewood. The stranger went with him and the other two went off in another direction. As the camper was about to get firewood, he was grabbed from behind by the stranger, who put his left hand across his mouth and attempted to cut his throat with the knife. He was sliced across the throat three times before he managed to push the attacker away. He fell to the ground and was then stabbed in the chest. The knife broke, leaving the blade embedded in his chest. The other two realized something was happening and tried to intervene, one being knocked to the ground and the other escaping to go get help. The cops were called and went searching for the guy who they eventually found. It turned out that he had recently spent a lot of time in a mental institution, suffered from a deep-seated mental illness, paranoid schizophrenia, and he had had an acute psychotic episode that day. As far as I know, he got locked up for a few years, but this happened about ten minutes away from my house. Horror movies come to life. I don't know if these two events are connected, but people say the Hellfire Club in that area, which also happens to be where these people were camping, is cursed. In my college days, now 20 years ago, my friends and I often took off for the North Georgia mountains on the weekend. We wanted to smoke, drink, and commune with nature, and these mountains were perfect. On the weekend, this unsettling event occurred. Me, my friend Bill, and his German shepherd, Monty, headed out towards Sky Valley. It was the beginning of fall semester at UGA, and not much was going on yet. We had found an area where a dirt road led back a half a mile, and then we would hike in another mile or so and set up camp near a creek. Excellent trails were nearby with fun places to explore, not to mention flat ground, perfect for setting up camp. Bill and I arrived at our spot at around 4 p.m. and got a fire going. We were musicians, Bill's a guitar player and I'm a percussionist, so we started smoking and jamming. Around 10, after jamming for a while, we chatted about life and girls before tucking in for the night. 
It was a clear night, and so we just slept under the stars. It's important to note that we've never seen any sign of other people in this area during any of our other trips. At about two in the morning, I was awoken by Monty growling. It was a deep, guttural growl. Bill was still dead to the world, and I sat up to look around and listen, thinking that maybe an animal had come near our site. The fire was only embers at this point. I heard barely audible voices in the distance. Focusing on the area of the voices, I saw a faint red glow, followed by another faint red glow to the left of the first. This was about a hundred yards away. My mind connected what I was seeing, cigarette embers burning, and they were getting closer. Bill, I whispered, wake up. Bill roused from his sleep and I explained what was going on. At this point, Monty started barking as the strangers approached camp. By the time we stood up, they were in the camp. Completely unfazed by the now rabid 70-pound German Shepherd, two incredibly unkempt late 30s, early 40s deliverance types walked up on us. Bill told Monty to calm down. I will never forget the look of these guys. Skinny as hell, about 5'8", shirts caked in grime, mangy beards, and probably five teeth between the two of them. Each had huge knives attached to their belt buckles. What you boys doing way out here? Look like you having a good time. We responded and told them that we'd been out there to camp and drink some beer. They asked if we had any weed and we gave them a joint. They looked around a bit and asked if we wanted to smoke with them. We declined, saying that we were heading out early. Throughout the conversation, anything Bill or I said, they looked at each other before responding. Finally, before they left, one of them hesitated for a moment and said, Y'all stay safe. Never know who you could run into out here. Followed by a laugh as they walked away. We packed up early and left. While this isn't as creepy as some other stories I've heard, these guys were the epitome of a backwood redneck. The fact that we only awoke because of the dog still sketches me out to this day. About 15 years ago, I lived in Sulphur, Oklahoma. My playground? The Chickasaw National Recreation Area. I loved that park so much. I rode more miles on my bike there than anywhere else. I've walked nearly every trail and ridden nearly every road. Every day I would ride my mountain bike up and down the trails and would be home by nightfall most days. One night, however, I had ridden out a bit further than usual. On my way back, however, I decided to ride the trail from an area known as Buffalo Springs. As the name suggests, they have live buffalo roaming and there's a large spring and fountain for all to enjoy. As I was riding back, I knew the end of the trail was coming up and I would have to cross a stone bridge across the creek and then up the road to my home. It was dark at this time and all I had to see by was the full moon. I was maybe a few hundred yards from it when I got a sharp pain in my left thigh. I stopped and looked around to see what had just hit me. Then I heard a noise sounding like something hitting the ground hard in front of me. There was a rock, about the size of a baseball, rolling across the trail. Me being confused, I looked up the side of the hill. Just as I turn to look, I almost fall off my bike when another rock comes flying down, hitting my front wheel. I finally get my eyes to adjust to look and see someone very tall and dark and covered in hair at the top of the hill, throwing things at me and screaming. I yelled that I had a cell phone and was going to call the police. I didn't actually have one, as I didn't have a cell phone yet. This seemed to have pissed him off. He started charging down the hill at me. For obvious reasons, I lit up my bike and took off. Just as I crossed the bridge, I heard a huge splashing noise in the creek. I saw that it was a huge rock that had been thrown. I was in the clear to home, but was frightened all the way there. I went to the ranger station later the next morning and told a ranger I knew there about what happened. He said, 
So you're telling me you were attacked by Bigfoot? He started snidely laughing. I said, listen, I don't know what it was, but something was trying to hurt me out there. The ranger just laughed. Okay, Justin, if we have any more Bigfoot, I'll let you know what we get. I said fine and left. The very next week, I was riding in the daylight when the park ranger pulled up next to me and told me to get in. I asked him why, and he said he needed to show me something. We headed to the police department in town. Before we got out of the car, he turns to me and says, Justin, I owe you a huge apology. I'll be honest, I didn't believe you when you told me the story of how you were attacked, but it's come to my attention that a couple was out in the same area last night, and they were attacked in the same way, saying they had seen a large hairy creature throwing rocks and sticks and screaming at them. They called the police and they came out with some of the other rangers, myself included. I immediately thought about what you told me. When we arrived and started up the hill, sure enough, we were having rocks and things thrown at us. Guns drawn and yelling, two officers tackled a man to the ground. He was six foot five, naked, covered in mud, had long hair and a large beard. Turns out he had escaped from the Veterans Center across Veterans Lake. Apparently, in his mind, he thought he was back in Vietnam, and he was trying to, quote, take out the enemy. The park ranger said that I was very lucky, because while he wasn't Bigfoot, he was trying to kill me. We went inside so I could give the police my statements as to what had happened. They had to send him somewhere to a more secure facility, and... To this day, I still get shivers when I hike that trail, and I always keep my eyes on the ridgetop. I definitely feel bad for the guy, but that was also one of the scariest things I've ever experienced in the backwoods.